Karen Adams. Bauer. Bordelon. Brayman. Casper. Chase. Sini. Doyle. Frickman. Gustafson. Hanscom. Katowski. Marley. Marshall. Martin. Massett. McDermott. Melendez. Mello Miller. Merritt. Monahan. Newsom. Oliver. Pasqualini. Perry. Powers. Quinn. Richards. Rogers. Sanford. Stanford, I mean. Irma Streeter. Jim Streeter. Strode. Thompson. Wagner. Washington. Wells. White House. Whitney. And Evan. Here. 23 at roll call. Madam moderator. Oops, 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 that's right. Forgot you. You're not on my list. <laughs> Representative <laughs> Bailey. It happens. <laughs> yeah. 24 at, at call. Thank you. <laughs> well, so welcome, uh, Representative Bailey. Thank you. Um, so let's. Uh, Take a moment of silence if you'd like to stand. And Representative Melendez, would you like to lead us in the pledge? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So the first item on our agenda is the approval of minutes from our last meeting. Thank you. Uh, Representative Richards. I have a correction. Yes. On page five, under rules and procedures, where I'm listed as the chairman, um, that was actually the meeting of the temporary rules and procedures committee, which I was not the chairman of, Doug Monaghan was, and it's just misleading the way that it's represented okay. there. Uh, there are also a couple typos. Yeah. But I can share those later if that's more appropriate. Do you want to go through appropriate. Mm -hmm. I, I have a few too, so I'll just give them to you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other changes? All right. Hearing none, uh, is all in favor of accepting the minutes? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. I just need to explain. What? I have to explain. Well, sorry. I was going to explain that. I can't change the, the agenda. Agenda. I can't change her name being here. Oh. Can't change that. Oh. Okay. Okay. Do you want to speak? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you my comp my edits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And uh, Representative Richards, if you would uh, give your edits after the meeting, to that would be great. Thank you. <coughs> All right. As long as nothing changes the minutes. All right. So now we have us. Uh, Citizens' petitions. I have a few uh, communications from members who aren't able to make it tonight. Uh, Representative Rogers, Whitney, Casper, Sini, Bauer, Massett, Doyle, Wagner, Strode, Perry, Stanford, and McDermott uh, communicated their inability to make it tonight. Okay. Um, on a better note, I do have liaisons that uh, have uh, come forward, uh, and so I want to announce that Gary Wells has uh, agreed to be the RTM liaison to the Golf Advisory Committee. 
Michael Whitehouse has uh, agreed to be the, liais the RTM liaison to the Economic Development Committee. Uh, Roseanne Katowski has agreed to be the liaison to the town council, and Portia Bordelon has agreed to be the liaison to the Board of Education. I would really still like to get uh, at least one additional person who would like to be a liaison for the town council and an additional person for the Board of Ed. So if anybody is interested in these positions, please, you can email me. Uh, and uh, these, these guys are really doing a great job and they just you know, want to be able to cover all the meetings and it would be nice to have at least two people for those committees, the council and the, and the board that, that meet quite frequently. So thank you. And thank you guys for your service. Um, all right, so we have a few other, um, we have some citizens petitions. I'll, sh I'll actually read those afterwards. Um, so this is the portion of the RTM agenda where the RTM welcomes comments from citizens. Each presentation should be limited to 10 minutes or less, and citizens should, if possible, submit written comments. Presentations should be limited to matters pertinent to Groton. The moderator or members through the moderator shall ask questions only in order to clarify the speaker's presentation. Responses may be given by the moderator and the town or the town manager. Citizens should make their presentations from the lectern and state their names and addresses for the record. And I, I, are there any citizens you can come up now? I don't believe there are, so we may move on. All right, I have a few other communications. Uh, there is a Mystic Irish 5K road race that's on March 17th. And uh, if you're interested in it, there's a flyer up here and the early bird sign up uh, is on February 17th. So if you're interested in that, please come and look at this flyer. Um, what else? Was there another one? Yeah. Oh, there's a letter. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And I also received a letter uh, from Shelley Gardner. And I will read that to you uh, right now briefly. Uh, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Spin it any way you want, but it is absolutely unacceptable to a community that we support the CEO of a failing school system. Michael Grainer is responsible for the success or failure of our schools. He should not have his contract renewed nor be given any percentage of a salary increase, but should be terminated immediately due to his inability to provide a quality education for the children of Groton. The taxpayers of Groton have provided a more than substantial budget for the successful <coughs> educating of our children. Due to, Ms. to Michael Grainer's incompetence we have been assigned an Alliance school label and are considered one of 30 failing school systems in Connecticut. I am appalled to know that this is considered acceptable to the Board of Education, the Town Council, and the Town Manager's Office in the Town of Groton. It is with utter disgust for those whom look the other way and reward this incompetence that I pen this email. Children's development is being toyed with when you support failure for educating them. That is never acceptable. Shelley Gardner. And I think maybe some of you have received this by email, so uh, those are the two communications I believe I've received. Besides people that called and said they wouldn't be here. Yeah. So we're going to have a report from the town manager, Mr. Burt. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, everyone should have a copy of my report. If not, it's over there on the table. Uh, just to point out a couple of the financials. The fund balance as of January 31st is $8.9 million, which is 7.44% of the FYE 2018 general fund adjusted budget. The general contingency budget, the current balance is $279,325. And then the capital reserve fund balance as of January 31st is approximately $1.2 million. Um, I just received in the last few days the 2017 Grand List Narrative Report for October 1st, 2017. I don't have it on me, but I'm going to have email that to Betsy if she could forward that to everyone. And then if you have any questions, you could email me and I'll get the answers to them, but I'll get that to you tomorrow. And just a couple uh, highlights from the report. Um, the 2018 Household Hazardous Waste Day this year is July 14th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Groton Transfer Station at 685 Flanders Road, that is uh, free of charge. Uh, the Groton Human Services is gonna start hosting their first monthly veterans coffee house at their building on Friday, February 16th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, staffed and paid for by the uh, Retired Senior Volunteer Program uh, that is free to veterans and their families. And then the Groton Public Library will have an open house for the local history room on Wednesday, February 28th from 2 p.m. until 4 p.m. And then if it's uh, possible, I have Chief Fusaro has asked to update you on a couple of quick projects if 
that's okay underneath it's, my report. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll be brief, but there's a few things I just want to bring to your attention and let you know that are going on in the police department. I think they're important things that, that you should be aware of, and, and some of them, uh, inevitably, I'll be before you again in the future to discuss. But uh, the nice-to-know uh, stuff is uh, we're about to field another canine unit. Uh, we're currently doing a selections process for a handler out of our existing staff. So I, in, the, uh, in the coming weeks, um, after training is complete, we'll have a third canine uh, team deployed. Uh, we're utilizing a host of different funds, as you may have seen in the manager's report. The canine unit itself has raised some funds to help offset costs, so uh, we're using that. Uh, we've long been one of my goals since becoming chief is to really reinstitute the community policing program here in town. Um, our officers are all community-oriented police officers, meaning they focus on problems when they can, but we needed to have uh, something a little bit more dedicated, and I think that's what I've heard from the town council, from elected officials, as well as members of the citizenry. And, and our staffing levels at the patrol level right now are going to enable us to uh, select an officer to, uh, to really be dedicated to that, where we'll put them certain days of the week in the three networking offices we have, one in Navy Housing, a second at Pequannock Bridge at the Fitch Middle School, and the third in downtown Mystic. And I hope to expound upon that more in the future. Um, our integration with dispatch has been going successful. Uh, we're, we're, we're working well together. But the two big projects that, that I need, uh, I've, I know I've briefed the prior RTM on, were some things that are really critical to the, uh, the police department. Uh, one is our radio system. We have an aging infrastructure within our radio system that really has met the end of its useful life. Uh, we have an 800 megahertz radio system, which was, uh, by most accounts, 25 to 30 years ago was when it first started getting fielded and then really fully implemented uh, closer to 20 years. But, but over the years, it's degraded. Uh, we have a lot of coverage gaps, which are officer safety issues for our officers. Uh, through the last year and a half, myself and the members of the police department staff have been looking at some other viable options. Um, I, I wish I could tell you it, it wouldn't cost anything, but that's not the case. It, it is a substantial investment. Um, so we're getting, we're getting some proposals now. There's been a couple of options that we're looking at, and we're trying to do what would work best, but at the, at the lowest price point possible. But to make sure that our officers are out there and that they're, they're, they're critical line of communications back to the dispatch center are viable and that when they need help and they need to communicate with with other officers that that doesn't fail um, so we've been working pretty hard on that and I hope to have a proposal that that I present to the town manager in the coming weeks um, to say this is what we think from our analysis is the best course of action and then uh, once we get the pricing in line to to uh, to bring that forward under a capital improvement project and I've already been in discussions with the town manager about that and the second one which kind of uh, fits with that is our, our uh, CAD and RMS project. Uh, for <clears throat> police departments use records management. Basically, when we write a report, when an officer goes investigate something, they write a report. And we have certain legal requirements to hold on to it for a certain amount of time. We also have data that we have to provide to the state of Connecticut as well as the FBI. Um, so we need, to, we need to have a good system that manages that. We do have a system right now that manages it. We also have a computer-rated computer dispatch system, and essentially what that is is when um, a call for service comes in, let's say it's a traffic accident, and it's called into the dispatch center, and there's a 911 call, dispatch will send an officer to that location, and it's in a computer system, which documents the time it came in and a lot of other data, you know, who made the call, uh, what time did the officer arrive. The problem that we have is for several years we've had two different systems where it's computer-aided dispatch and records management. And they're really supposed to be integrated, but unfortunately through a, through a series of events that didn't happen. So we've been looking at either upgrading or replacing the systems we have with one that is fully integrated that ensures that our officers and dispatch staff and fire personnel all get the information they need to provide services to the community in a timely manner, but also to document it properly and provide that data to other entities as we each need to do. So we've been working on that for uh, for several months, and I'm, I'm happy to report that we've got a committee that's been established that has police officers, members of the dispatch staff, as well as uh, other stakeholders in the community in both fire and EMS that have been meeting on a weekly basis to look at proposals that we received 
uh, back in the fall. We received eight proposals. They went to uh, our purchasing agent, and they've been going through them to find out what would be best for, uh, for all of our involved entities. So again, that's another, uh, another effort that's underway. Uh, there will be costs associated with that, but yet we're, there's currently costs associated with it. We have two different systems. Uh, we're hoping to identify one system where we put it all together uh, and, and move forward. So um, some other nice to, to know things is that we've been really, uh, I think, effectively engaging with our partners in fire and EMS. Uh, myself, uh, as well as Joe Zastry and others, have had some meetings recently to ensure that we're providing the services uh, to them that they need to make sure that we work cooperatively and collaboratively with them. And, uh, and the last thing, again, another nice to know thing, uh, uh, police work has evolved and changed over several years. It, it constantly does. One of the big threats that we see in, in this line of work is cyber and the fact that we get a lot of complaints from people in the public that have either been the victims of identity theft or fraud or um, scams done through the internet. Um, our officers are, are, are doing a lot of work on that. We get those reports quite frequently, but we've uh, been able to secure a slot in a class at no cost to the town uh, for one of our officers to get really advanced training that's uh, conducted down in Alabama by the United States Secret Service, and he'll be leaving for that class in April, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, we'll bring back not, not just a lot of training, but a lot of equipment that comes along with it. So um, that's just a, a brief summary. I think I, I think I covered everything, I hope. Are there any questions of me? Representative Frickman. Thank you, Mr. Monterey. Uh, I just had one question, um, and I can't remember, for, it's actually for you and, and Dr. Grenier. Um, and in light of today's events, mm -hmm. um, I didn't know if from last year what we did with the school resource officer or if the school resource officer was still full time or if we limited that last year. I can't remember that conversation yeah, we had. We've worked very closely together, myself and Dr. Grenier. I'm, I'm happy to tell you there is yeah. a full time He's police full -time. officer okay. in. in uh, and uh, I shared uh, an email earlier with the town manager and Dr. Grenier, which I won't go into all the details of it, but it was about the unfortunate incident that took today. And uh, you know, I assured both of them that we'd have a, an increased presence with our officers at all the schools in town. Uh, that officer is, sorry. The officer is, is he at the high school permanently or yes. is he between all the schools? He's or at the high school. You know, we do try to get officers that are on patrol to stop by the other schools. We've got uh, some of our investigators that go in to teach for the schools or at the middle schools and elementary schools on a regular basis. Thank you. So I don't mean to answer for you, but that's. Full time, 100%. That's right, okay. He's a member of the staff. Because I remember last year, oh, sorry. I just remember last year we had that conversation in the budget, yeah. and that was almost a possibility of getting cut. Fully so, okay. funded in next year's budget. And I, and I have to point out the Board of Ed's been great about that, providing support to, financial support to make sure that happens. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, oh, Representative Wells. Uh, I read in the paper the other day that Stonington is working on their communications there, and they're, they're talking about integrating with the state communications system, and I'm sure you're looking into this, but this would seem like we spend a lot of time talking about whether the city can talk to the town, the town or the fire department. It sounds like if we go vertically, then we can talk to Stonington, Waterford, Ledger, Norwich, whatever we need to do. And that would be the, you know, looking at that rather than trying to bring, get our different police departments all using the same walkie-talkie. That, that is one of the options that we've been taking a serious look at. There's a couple of systems out there in this area of the state that, uh, that we've explored. Uh, quite frankly, doing it on our own is probably the least economical and least advantageous process to go through. But that, that system, that article you read, we've, uh, we've been engaged in those conversations as well. And I've met regularly with uh, the chief of police in Stonington. And we work quite closely with them, particularly when there's events in Mystic. So um, yeah, that's, we're, we're exploring uh, that system as well. Representative Bailey. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Is You're this working? Aaron. Okay. Maybe I can just speak a little louder. Uh, I have a question for uh, Chief Ferrazzo. Um, would uh, it be a consideration that the antenna tower, because it's antenna height above ground, mm -hmm. that probably stipulates how far we can go over the horizon? And really, it's probably not so much the horizon uh, as far as being able to reach that squad car out there on the, in the field. Uh, perhaps it's terrain and when you go out west or north actually you know especially north the terrain gets a little bit more rugged and that provides shadowing of the signal mm -hmm. 
And uh, having, a, I know being on a coast and being an amateur radio operator, especially for two meter VHF and UHF work, uh, that's been a, a long standing problem for amateur radio operators. But we have a repeater systems that are located in Norwich and uh, other towns, and they are located in a high spot. And uh, that antenna height above ground at a repeater station means a big difference. Have you considered that? Yeah, the FCC regulates what frequencies we can be on. We can't be on high band. Well, we, we can be on high band. We're not. We're on 800 megahertz. But the elevation of our tower is dictated by the FAA since we're so close to the airport. Can't go any higher than that. But certainly terrain does. Terrain features play a role in it, absolutely. Uh, but the system that we're looking at, we do, we've been doing some pretty detailed analysis of where there's coverage gaps. And that's all taken into account with, by people a lot smarter than me when it comes to uh, uh, the X's and O's of radio systems, but we've, we've been fortunate in dealing with some people that really know a lot about that. Uh, I just don't understand if possibly is there a higher spot in Groton? Uh, there probably is, but I, I would, <laughs> where I'm, would I'm it trying be? to do this as, as economically as possible, and there are higher spots, but it would require additional antenna sites to be built, and that's, that's an expensive proposition. So we're trying to try not to do that. We're trying to use existing infrastructure that's already out there and hopefully leverage some, some stuff that belongs to maybe some other parties that, that they may let us use to you know, do it on the, on the least expensive side. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Representative Washington. Is the system that the town's going to use, is, will it be integrated with the City of Groton Police Department? I, I've discussed it with Chief Spellman. I've discussed uh, at length with, uh, with both him and um, um, uh, Chief Nixon as well so that they'd be able to capitalize on it. Um, it would be available. I, I, I don't mean to speak for either one of them. Uh, you'd have to ask them of their interest as to getting on it. The, the problem is we're on different frequencies right now. So we're at 800 megahertz. They're at, they're at different frequency levels. Um, currently, many of our uh, officers and our supervisors do have the capability of talking to them today through some of the, through some of the radio systems we've bought in the last couple of years. That won't change. Um, but it's, if I understand your question, it's are we all going to be on one radio system? Is that what you're asking? Well, so if you need to help each other, you have a way to communicate. Right. There's something going on at the Groton Plaza. Mm -hmm. Can the city please come and help us? Sure, that's interoperability, and that's the whole focus of any of these, being able to talk to not just them, but to Ledger, Stonington, uh, New London, Waterford, any of our surrounding public safety partners we want to be able to talk to. I, I hope I answered your question. Thank you. All right, thank you for your time. Mr. Burt, do you have any additional? No? OK. Now we're going to go into the reports from uh, economic development. I have a question for you. Oh, uh, Representative Katowski. I have a question for the town manager. Would now be the right time? Sure. OK. Um, I have two questions. The first one's about the oral school. The second one's about Fitch Middle School. Um, it's my understanding that the bids for the Mystic Oral School are due tomorrow. And my question is, will the town provide the top options that are being considered to the public for input before making the final selection? I'm not sure the process is fully laid out yet. The, the committee has not even been fully formed yet. So there's still more discussions on how the process is going to work. Okay. And, and I do know that there were surveys to the neighbors early on to see what kind of things they were open to to try to get that public input. And my second question is about Fitch Middle School. And there was an article in the paper this week that it's going to be a community center. And I already got my survey question to put my submission in for what the name is. Um, OK, I'm wondering if, shouldn't the RTM have been told that last month before we approved $75,000? If that fact was known, maybe there would be additional questions. I know I would have had one. That would be, what is the long-term financial plan for this building? Um, I believe uh, nothing's changed since last month. It, it's just that they decided to call it a community center. The plan hasn't changed. They're just moving their, their uh, rest of their uh, activities from uh, Sealy School to there because the Sealy School won't be available. So nothing's really changing. It's the same thing. They just, because it just says Fitch Middle School, they just wanted to call it something so people know where to go. So there's, 
Um, but in terms of long-term planning, we're still discussing, that's one of the priorities of the new council is let's put together a full plan. This, this park move was planned even before I got here. It was already in process. And what we've said is um, at this point, we're not gonna do anything else until we have some sort of plan in place. So, Thank you. So. Representative Chase. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Mr. Burt, I was talking to a constituent over the last week or two, and they had a couple of questions that they were wondering if I could get some input on it. Um, they are, were concerned that every single Monday, a town street sweeper goes up and down Long Hill Road, which is a state road, and they were wondering why the town is cleaning that street. I'll, I, I'll have to get with um, Gary Schneider, the public works director, to find out exactly what the particulars of, are of that. Okay, and their other concern was that on a snow day, on, when there's no school, why is a, um, a plow plowing out uh, school yards and school driveways when there is no school at five o'clock in the morning, which would be overtime? And, and again, I'll look into that. Do you know which okay. schools particularly? Because my understanding um, is we do some of the schools, the school does some of the schools, but they have their own plows too, so I don't, you know. I believe it was S.B. Butler. Do you know which one? Is that Who does that? Is that down by Fishtown Road and down that? I, I, I think S.P. Butler uh, could be done by our personnel, and they may be doing it, of course, just in, in, in anticipation uh, that the schools uh, will be open the next day. Okay, so is that, would that be a town plow, even no, if it's yours? If it's S.P. Butler, I, I believe it's a school district plow. Okay, so maybe I have the wrong school, but he did say it was a town plow. So I can find out what school it was. Yeah. But he definitely said it was at five o'clock in the morning when school is closed. Right. So, and it will be closed for the day, in other words. Right. So, thank you. You're welcome. And I, and I will get the answer to the other one and uh, I'll email it to Betsy when I send out the uh, other information. All right, thank you. Thank you. So I think the next thing on our agenda is the report of economic development. Is that Mr. Reiner? Okay, you're on. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's John Reiner. I'm the Director of Planning and Development for the town. I've met a number of you, but there are a lot of you I still haven't met. I do have some handouts. Um, if you didn't get one, I'll leave some by the, uh, the door. Uh, that show some of the promotional materials, some of the things that we've been doing in Groton for marketing the town. Uh, I've been here for about three and a half years as the town's planning director, and when I got here, we didn't have a lot of marketing materials, a lot of good ways to promote Groton. And although uh, for tonight, I'd rather you listen to the presentation that I'm gonna give instead of flipping through the cool folder, uh, there's something you can take home and uh, look at uh, after the fact. So what I wanna try to accomplish tonight are two things. Uh, to introduce myself, the department, some of the initiatives that we're working on uh, in the recent past and now, and then do a little bit of a deeper dive into something that we've been working on called tax increment financing. Uh, a number of you have spoken to me about that, had some questions. There'll be a public hearing uh, before the town council on the first step forward on tax increment financing on February uh, 27th before the council, uh, 6 p.m. I would encourage all of you to come to that, hear a little bit about it. So um, within the Office of Planning and Development Services, there, there's three divisions. So we're really soup to nuts for development. It's planning and development, zoning, inspection services, and economic development. And by having all of us in one place, we're able to meet with developers as the program starts as they have concepts and ideas to bring forward it, uh, the whole concept from beginning through the process and zoning and permitting, construction and inspection, all the way to uh, enforcement if they're not uh, doing things the way they should be. Again, our role, if we don't have a coordinated effort of how we're approaching planning and economic development, there are a lot of great people and organizations in the town that are trying to pull things together. But if we're not working together as a team, we're all kind of just floundering around in one direction. Our goal the past few years is to try to get everybody on that economic development wagon and going in the right direction and the same direction. So 
One of the first things that we did uh, about three years ago was we did something called a market analysis. And that market analysis was to take a snapshot of what is Groton like right now from an economic perspective, what are our needs, and where are we going to understand you know, I, I often hear from people, hey, I'd love to have a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's in town. Well, what is the market? What are, you know, how many people are living here? Where are they commuting from? The types of jobs that we have? And how can we take Groton to the place where we all want it to be? And it laid out an action plan for how we could actually get to a better Groton. One of the things that we learned that was really eye-opening to us is we're very lucky. We have Electric Boat, we have Pfizer, we all know that. They contribute a lot to our tax base. We have about 26,000 jobs every day in Groton, but of those 26,000 jobs, only 20% of those people live in Groton. So that's 80% of those people that are leaving all the time, going to other communities, spending their money, paying their tax dollars. How could we attract some of those people to get better development here in Groton? So identifying our action plan, the things that we can do. So some of the things that we've highlighted uh, and worked on over the past few years, I'll kind of get into some of those uh, in some of the later slides, but tax increment financing was the biggest one in here as a game changer. Developing marketing materials and promotional materials for the town. Uh, doing an independent economic development website for the town. We just finished that uh, a couple of months ago. If you haven't seen it, please check it out. Uh, we did a really great promotional video uh, working with the library staff, editing for it. Uh, it's about a four minute promotional video for Groton. I'd encourage you to check that out. And again, those are all great things, but one of the things we really have to focus on to set Groton apart, and you know, in talking to different people, of Wow, we have such a diverse economy. We have these great, you know, tax base. Why haven't we changed? Why have we slowly degraded over time? Because we haven't focused enough on place, on establishing a, a great sense of place in Groton. When we go on vacation, we don't go to just strip mall centers. We go to places that we're going to remember, walkable communities where it's vibrant, where we're going to see people, or there's you know great national monuments, areas like Mystic. Those are the things that. Although we can't replicate Mystic, we can create those types of environments where people are living, where people are able to live, work, play, recreate, shop, and, and enjoy life. So those are some of the things that we really learned from that market analysis. As part of that process, we also did an overview of our regulatory process, of our zoning, and are, are we going in the right track or not? Because often, when people aren't happy with the types of development that we're getting, well, if developers are building what our regulations allow and are encouraging, then it's our fault for not writing better regulations. And that's what came out of this regulatory audit that we did, um, trying to streamline our process, try to make a more concise document, and really talk about the goals of what we want and how people can build those mixed-use developments. Today, we really don't have a good mixed-use development zone on the books. The one that we do have, creates quite a burdensome process for developers. If they have to spend a lot of time, uncertainty, and money on the process, they're not going to come here with their money. They're going to go somewhere else. They're going to go to East Lyme or Old Saybrook or Waterford or just not even Connecticut at all. So we have to level the playing field and make things easy for the types of development that we want where we want it. Not just opening the floodgates and um, making it easy to do anything anywhere, but consistent with our plans and our visions. So as part of that regulatory reform, rewriting our zoning, which is something we've been working on for over a year and we're hoping to be finished uh, this time next year, but maybe a little bit uh, earlier than that, that's setting the table. That's getting the attractive developers here, attracting them, getting them interested in it. But economic development and other things like TIF, that's, that's bringing the meal. That's, that's putting the, the, the steak on the plate. So, the reform isn't going to do everything. Just because we write great zoning, that isn't going to make development happen here. So as part of that development equation, we're often thinking about, I think a lot of times, for a long time, municipalities thought, you do the zoning, and then we wait. The developers are going to come, and they're going to build great things. But we have to have some skin in the game. There has to be that public-private partnership. And that's where planning and economic development really come together, the council, the RTM, getting people involved and understanding that if we put a little bit in to help offset or attract development, those good developers are going to come to the town. 
So these are all the things that we've been setting the table for over the past two or three years. And then those other things, the website, the tax increment financing, those are the tools that are going to help us implement all of these great ideas. Something else that I often like to talk about with people is oftentimes we will do a plan. We did the market analysis. We did the regulatory audit. Uh, we recently updated our long-range plan of conservation and development. And there are a number of people that say, all right, great, you did the plan, so now you're all done. Well, no, the plans were the concepts. Now we have to spend the money and do the, hard, the really hard work, and that's why that last slide, the implementation, that's the hard part, actually putting the rubber to the road and implementing those plans so that market analysis saying we should do tax increment financing. That takes time, it takes money. We need to do the regulatory update, the rewriting of the zoning regulations. It takes time, staff time, effort, time before the town council, the zoning commission and all of you, you know, hearing from us about what it is we're trying to do. Another tool that we did was, uh, as an economic development tool, this airport development zone, similar to um, other incentive type programs in town. This is something building off, we have a great asset in town, the airport. We haven't been building off of that enough. This is a state program, uh, something we adopted about a year ago that, although it hasn't been utilized by anyone yet, it's something we see as a good tool, just another option. Another thing that we wanted to address and something we heard as part of that regulatory process was doing business in Groton was not easy. So not only are we streamlining the process, but can we create a guide for people to easily walk through that process? So uh, we'll actually be rolling this guide out in the next week, a doing business in Groton guide. So developers, small business owners, people that are already existing in town can have a step-by-step -step guide of how can they do things in Groton in a very easy way. Tax increment financing. Um, after we, I kind of give the overview, I'm going to do a, a, a deeper dive into tax increment financing, but kind of the, the two main points I like to make to people about tax increment financing is it is not a new tax. I think that's the most important thing that we can talk about. It's not a new tax. Secondly, it's that public-private partnership, that putting the skin in the game. Without tax increment financing, that development that we want to see happen in only in certain districts, not everywhere in town, in those growth districts that we're identifying, without ta tax increment financing, that development wouldn't happen. So you'll often hear when people talk about tax increment financing, they say, but for tax increment financing, that development wouldn't happen. And I, I can get into some of the details on that uh, a little bit more in a few minutes, but that's kind of the two big takeaways uh, from that. The two main districts that we're proposing right now within the town of Groton proper are the Route 1 corridor, uh, kind of the Benny's Plaza, Big Y, that general area. The other district is at the intersection uh, north on Route 184 and 117. So those are the two areas that we've targeted. We're also working with the city of Groton to do TIF districts along Thames Street and also at Five Corners. So right now, the intersection of 184, 117, there's a big vacant property on the, the northwest side of that roadway. We have a developer who's proposing to do an $80 million mixed-use development there. But for tax increment financing, it won't happen. He needs us to help through certain processes on TIF, tax increment financing TIF, if I use, planners use too many acronyms, he wouldn't be able to build this because he needs a sewer line. And that's something that is part of that public-private partnership. These are just some concept drawings of what he's proposing to do. This is just one development of many that will happen in these TIF districts. That website that I was talking about, that standalone economic development website, this is just a screenshot from it. I encourage all of you to take a look at it. It's, uh, we spent some time on it. We've gotten a lot of uh, hits on it. And when people are searching for Groton, the town website uh, isn't the greatest for those of you that have looked at it before. And we really wanted to stand out. And if economic development is a high priority for us, we needed to do something like this. 
We also did a branding contest to say, all right, you know, the brand of town, the town seal, we're all very proud of it, but that's not how we market the town. We wanted to do something that set us apart a little bit. And if you notice our brand, the colors, that's in all of our new marketing material of what we're doing. So instead of paying uh, some out, you know, out of town consulting firm, big dollars to do uh, marketing and branding for us, we actually put it out as a contest to the town and got a lot of good submittals, and this is something uh, that came out of it. We're all very proud of that. Something else we've been doing for a while, uh, Mrs. Uh, Katowski just uh, mentioned the Mystic Ed Center. So we've been trying and uh, doing more than trying, marketing excess public property. So some of the key ones that we've been working on, the Mystic Education Center, uh, Groton Heights, the Groton Sealy School, those are all properties that have been sitting underutilized, not on the tax roll for a lot of years. Uh, the Mystic Education Center, we've been marketing that for, a, for almost a year, putting out promotional materials, showing the property to, to developers. We put a, a request for proposals out two months ago. They're due tomorrow. There will be a, a, a public process and how that is done and selected, but we're very excited about the potential development that we could see happen there. Um, and that's just, picking the preferred developer who then has to go through a very public rezoning process, the development review process, and other things. So that's something we're really excited about. Uh, short, probably in about two months, we'll put an RFP out for Groton Heights, and then probably, depending on how things go with the Sealy School, we've been trying to work with the abutting property owner there. Uh, we're hopeful that that can move forward. Uh, so we have a lot of irons in the fire just on properties that we, the town, control that today are not on the tax roll, that once they get on the tax roll, we will be contributing quite a bit to the town. Just some of uh, the cut sheets, which you'll actually see in your little booklets here of some of the ways we're promoting these properties. Not only are we promoting properties, we're also promoting some of the industry, some of the places in Groton. So again, some of those are within your booklets here. Another project we've been working on, we'll be wrapping up probably in the next two months, is um, directional gateway signage. So we're all, you're all from Groton. Getting around Groton isn't the easiest thing in the world. Uh, between the city, Groton Long Point, no ink, Mystic, oh, Mystic, wait, is that, is that in Stonington? Is Mystic the town of Mystic? I mean, the things that we hear from people that don't, that come from the outside, that we want to move here, want to invest in here, they need to know how to get around. I mean, we have a, a bit of a transient population with the military base, and again, just with all the folks that work at Pfizer and EB that don't live here, getting good directional signage around the town is a very important piece to branding Groton and building upon our sense of place. If you go to some of those cool tourist destinations, Portland, New Hampshire, uh, or Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Portland, Maine, you'll see stuff like this around those communities and it makes it easier for people to get around and understand the geography of the town. This is, a, all we did in this instance was the study designing areas, looking at options for designs of the sign. That's not the implementation in order to actually start constructing these types of signs. It's something that we put in our capital improvement project, and I don't think we're going to be looking for money for it until uh, a number of months from now, if not a year or more from now. But that's something that all of you will have a bite at that apple. Once this project wraps up the plan, uh, we were just talking about it internally today, we do want to do a presentation on it in detail to both the town council and to you, the RTM, so you can understand what it is, and if it's something that you like, well then we'll end up asking for money and looking to move forward to implement that. Again, just a few more uh, examples of some of that signage around town. Another really good project that we've been working with New London and the city of Groton uh, has been the Thames River Innovation Places. We received uh, a $900,000 grant from the state. We we're one of four municipalities selected as an innovation place within the state to try to attract new small businesses, building upon the assets that we have. Very exciting uh, effort. 
We've also been looking at environmental issues, climate change and sea level rise, and how those are going to impact Groton as time moves on. Uh, we worked with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, they had an intern did this work for us for free. We just had to meet with them and review it, and I, we got some pretty exciting information about it. Some of it's scary, looking at uh, the Pequannock Bridge area, uh, some of the Route 1 corridor, and the impacts in the future from sea level rise. Things that we need to start planning for now and in the future. Those are all the conceptual things, all the plans, all the projects we've uh, been working on. There's also been a substantial, about a, a substantial amount of new construction in town. If you haven't driven around, um, we get a lot of new restaurants. Some of them uh, existing or have put new money into it. Uh, a lot of new businesses in Mystic. There was a Boston Globe article uh, a number of months back calling out Mystic as a foodie destination for New England. We're really seeing a lot of things good happening there. Uh, new housing and apartments. So up on Route 12 in Gunjiwamp, we're going to see about 146 apartments. Uh, you've probably seen they've cleared a bunch of land there. They've been doing that for a number of months. Some pretty big boulders and uh, other things they had to move out. Uh, they just grabbed the building permit for the first building on that today. We expect them to start construction on that soon. Branford Manor. We worked with uh, an outside investor who purchased Branford Manor, and they're going to be, they're already uh, actually doing it, investing $18.5 million in retrofitting Branford Manor. That's an area that needed investment, and this was something that we're able to work with the developer, uh, stabilize their taxes for a period of time so that they could invest money in that area and uh, make better housing opportunities for the people that are, that are living there. Central Hall, we've all been hearing about it for a long time. If you've driven through Mystic lately, you've seen it's under construction. Uh, the cold temperatures that we had last month slowed things down a little bit. Now that it's warming up, they're picking up the pace on that, which is really exciting. Uh, another, our Community Development Block Grant Program, which is something uh, I don't know if a lot of people really know about, but in the last few years, uh, what, four out of the last five years, we've gotten an $800,000 grant from the state. So Mystic River Homes, we got an $800,000 grant this past year to do some uh, ADA compliance and some other improvements to that uh, low mod income housing development there. Some new businesses, Beard Brewing, uh, the new U-Haul facility um, up on 184. Good things are happening here. And then sometimes it's just uh, some of our old shopping plazas giving, uh, getting a facelift, uh, the Aldi's Plaza. They also put some additions there, as well as a number of other buildings in town we've seen some new investment in, which is a good thing. If we see people reinvesting in our community, that's uh, adding years of life to those buildings and uh, improving our tax base. So circling back on that sense of place, this is something that we all have to contribute to and help make Groton a better place that people want to live, people want to relocate and bring their businesses here. So there's a lot of strategies of how we can do that. It's something that our main goal, that sense of place and improving Groton is a place. We have an incredible opportunity before us right now with Electric Boat. The amount of hiring they're going to be doing there over the next five to ten years is a once in a generation opportunity. So. That's why myself, my staff, we're really excited about the things that are happening in Groton and the opportunities that we have here. We have a lot of good momentum, but we need to keep that momentum moving forward. If we drop the ball now, if we don't take advantage of the, the growth in jobs, the uh, jobs that are going to be coming here due to attrition at EB, other communities, Norwich, Waterford, Stonington, are going to be picking up in getting those big pieces. Right now, we're ahead of the curve in the things that we're doing from a planning and economic development perspective. All the other communities in the region are watching what we're doing. Uh, and I think a lot of them are envious of the programs that we're able to do, tax increment financing, these other things that are going to be game changers for Groton. And it's not just about the Office of Planning and Development Services. When we think about that sense of place, without a great senior center, without a great library, parks and recreation programs, plowing our roads and maintaining them, those are all part of the components of what people are looking for in a good community when they move there. They don't want roads with potholes. They want great schools. They want good administration and services. So as we're thinking and going through the budgetary process, I mean, it, it, it's always, Every year it's a, it's a tough sell of what do we do and how do we approach the budget, but 
the, the more we invest in our community, especially at this very critical time right now, the more opportunity we have to attract people to Groton. So that's kind of the, the general overview of our department and some of the things that we're working on. I'd love to answer a few questions on that and then take a few minutes and do a, a deeper dive into tax increment financing specifically. So any questions that folks have on any of the items that I just went over? Uh, Representative Powers. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, John, question for you is, um, with the tax increment financing, yes. do we have any kind of plan on the books to do any kind of green energy tax credits for businesses coming into our town or, or any smart building stuff with the new zoning stuff that you incorporated into when you redid the planning and zoning? I think the state has a plan or a program uh, in place right now dealing with like green uh, energy tax credits. We haven't written into our zoning code yet things like LEED certified buildings or giving extra credit for that. That might be step two. I think right now we're on a bit of a tight, tight timeline because effective January 1st, 2019, our planning and zoning commission are going to be combined. We want to get the zoning regulations done in that time and then once the new planning and zoning commission <coughs> is established we can start looking at some of the other some of those other um, i don't want to really call them secondary issues but there's so many other big things that we have to tackle first that's kind of uh zoning 2.0 is as far as how we're looking at it yeah. representative katowski are questions about the sewer line going to be answered in your TIF proposal? Uh, they could be. Okay. I mean, I could, if, if you're, have, have at it. All right. So coming up from 117, it's my understanding that the sewer line is at the Marriott. Is that correct? Correct. And we want to get it up to Route 184. Correct. Okay. So in the TIF presentation, we're going to hear something about we're not going to bond it. Uh, I'm, I just i am afraid to pay for that. Uh, well, I can tell you right now, so when I go into tax increment financing uh, in a couple of minutes, I wasn't going to talk about that particular development because one, we'll have a bite at that apple much later. But no, we're not going to bond for that. The way that we want to do it is something called a credit enhancement agreement where most likely the developer will be the one building that sewer line to our standards, inspections, and everything else. And then through tax increment financing, we're able to help him finance the cost of that. Not the town, not the town bonding. Um, so I'll get into some of the specifics, a little bit more of that, dealing with the TIF, the TIF policy, the TIF master plans, and then the financing mechanism, the credit enhancement agreement. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Director Reiner, you were talking before about what people want to see when they come to town. I believe you did a survey, right? Yes, we did. Uh, off the top of your head, what were the results of that survey? What, what are people looking for when they come to a town? Oh, Sorry, you this is like Actually, a tax you know what? memory. The, the survey is in here. Um, I, a part of it, I think, a summary of it. So after we did that market analysis, uh, we contracted with a firm called Great Blue, and we did a phone survey of uh, from an economic development, but also from a um, what people are looking for in town. And this was a not a survey monkey. This was a statistically significant uh, survey. It was a representative uh, pool of people from the town. So these are real results that we can actually say, oh, this this is what people are looking for. Some of the things people are looking for: better parks and recreation services, better beaches, good public services, nice schools. Um, I, I don't remember all the specifics, so I don't want to misspeak. That survey, I believe, is uh, at least the highlights are in your packet. It's also on that economic development web page, oh, wrong direction. And you can find a link to that survey on there. If you can't find it, shoot me an email, and I'll help you find it. Uh, so where is that page? Oh, Representative Mello Miller. There. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I just was curious, you mentioned rezoning. Do you have specific executable recommendations for these areas that you're wanting to re, re, the rezone? Excuse me, sorry. Yes. 
So I'm sorry, did you didn't did you really go in? You started to go into it and then you kind of backed away. So you have ideas? Yes. Uh, so right now we've been meeting with the zoning commission twice a month for the almost the past <laughs> two years working on rewriting the zoning regulations. So there's a lot of pieces to it. There's definitions, there's use tables, and then there's all of our different districts in town. We're not proposing uh, massive sweeping changes of zoning throughout the town. We're not gonna change everyone's residential districts to commercial districts. The things that we're looking at, probably the most substantial rezonings we'll be doing, will be in the areas around Route 1. Right now it's called the downtown design district. We want to create that into a mixed use district that shows what we want and makes it an easy process to do that. That intersection at Route 184 and 117. So the areas that we've identified in our long range plan, our plan of conservation and development, or you'll hear people call it the POCD, the zone changes that we want to do are consistent with that plan. So it's not something we've just kind of picked out of the sky. It's something that visioning, we, the town started working on the, the update to the plan of conservation and development probably two years before I even started working here. So it was something we got a lot of public input. So that is driving all of our zoning changes as far as specifics. Um, if you have more specific questions of areas, happy to share some of the documents that we've been working on. Um, but if people want to learn more about the zoning that we're working on, next Wednesday night, the Zoning Commission is holding a meeting to talk about, our consultants are going to be there to talk about mixed use zoning. If you don't know what that is, or if you're just slightly interested in zoning, please come to the meeting. We want more public input from people on the RTM, everyday citizens. Uh, we also have a web page uh, or specifically to the zoning rewrite project showing all the staff reports, the meeting minutes, the agendas, all the work that we've put into it. I'd encourage you to take a look at those items. If you have questions, uh, myself, you could reach out to uh, Deb Jones, my assistant director of planning and development sitting right, right over there. Diane Golombowski, any of us can help uh, guide you through your questions that you have on that. But we certainly, we, we want more participation. We encourage good questions and participation in that project. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I need 30 seconds to just switch presentation. Okay, I got it. I think the last time I gave that present, that last presentation, it took a little over an hour. So we're speeding through it, so I won't keep you all out too late on Valentine's Day. So briefly, tax increment financing. So also, town council, uh, February 27, the 6 p.m. is having a public hearing. After that public hearing, they'll close the hearing. Um, they could make a decision on that within a couple of weeks of the policy on tax increment financing. They're adopting that as an ordinance. That will come back before the RTM. So I wanted to get before you tonight to hear your, one, give you an overview, hear your questions and concerns, and then if there are things that are outstanding, we can certainly address that as we're moving forward. So what I wanted to quickly go over, what is TIF, you know, the uses of it, the goals, what do we do with it, and how does it impact the town? So tax increment financing, I, I hate normally reading off of slides, but in some of these instances, I have to a little bit because it's, it's not that complex, but it's very dense in, in how tax increment financing works. It's a financing mechanism to use to catalyze economic development. I mean, that's, that's a key point of it. It's a property tax benefit from a project to help finance the project. Without tax increment financing, that development wouldn't otherwise happen. So 184 and 117, we haven't seen development happen there because the sewer line extension is too costly for one property owner to bear the cost of that. The town peoples uh, didn't want to all pay for extending a sewer line there. Maybe that's not fair to all of you. So how can the developer or the developers in that area say, well, we would like to build this great development here, but we need to be able to carry that cost over or can the town take a portion of the future taxes so right now and i'll go into an example uh, in a couple of slides 
that property is only paying very minimal taxes. With this development, a lot more taxes will be generated. If we take a portion of those future taxes that wouldn't otherwise be generated and pay them back to the developer to help make up for that funding shortfall. That's what tax increment financing can do. It's used to support projects that otherwise would not occur. Oh, wrong direction. Again, TIF is not a new tax. This is not something that will be taxing people within or outside of the district. It's not a special assessment. Sometimes you hear about these special business districts and, oh, there's a new tax. That is not what tax increment financing is about. There's a number of ways we can use tax increment financing. Um, sorry, the screen's a little too far away here. We can use it for land acquisition, streetscapes, infrastructure improvements, helping to finance projects, making projects better. Uh, a whole list of things. A lot of this goes into the policy uh, and the master plan for tax increment financing. The goals of tax increment <coughs> financing, really making Groton a better place and getting the development that we want. I mean, I, I think those are uh, some key points of it. It is the best economic development tool. It's a lot better than just our general tax abatement. Our general tax abatements are a useful tool, but they don't help get reinvestment back into an entire area. So the revenue sharing, and this can get into this, kind of some of the nitty gritty of tax increment financing. I expect you to have questions. There'll be a test at the end. So. That hypothetical $80 million development that we're talking about at 184 and 117, when we assess property, we actually assess things at 70% of the valuation. That's how things work in Connecticut. So for example, if the increase in assessed value of that property from what it pays in taxes today to when it's fully built out is $50 million. Multiply that by the, the current mill rate, our annual revenue for the project in one year, is one point, almost $2 million of new taxes. Again, that otherwise we wouldn't be getting without TIF. Over 30 years, that's over $35 million. So how does tax increment financing work? So that sewer line that we're talking about, that could potentially cost $6 million. Somewhere in that ballpark, $4 million, $6 million. And I'm just kind of throwing some general numbers out here right now. Depending on, so, what type of agreement we reach called a credit enhancement agreement with the developer that a developer comes in, the way we've set up this process is the developer comes in, they say, hey, we want to do this development, we want to utilize a credit enhancement agreement. They talk to planning staff and the town manager. We work with the finance department, we work with the tax assessors. We also have a consultant reviewing those numbers. The developers have to show us their books, all of their finances. This isn't just a money grab by a developer. They have to show us the true cost and the gap in financing that they have. We then formulate that all together. We take it to the town council. They refer it to the Economic Development Commission. They refer it to the Tax Increment Financing Advisory Committee. And they will also be referring those to the RTM for your review and guidance to ask questions. We want this to be a very public, transparent process. After everyone has looked at that, the recommendations go up to the town council, and the town council makes the ultimate decision on how are we helping to finance through, not a bond, but the future taxes that that developer would pay. So if they don't ever build the project, we're not ever paying them any money back because they would, that developer would pay an annual revenue $1.18 million. Depending on the type of agreement that we reach with them and for the period of time, if we said, all right, well, we, the town, will keep 50% of that new tax revenue and we need to give the developer back 50% to pay back that sewer over, say, you know, we're rounding a little bit here, over 10 years, well, the town would get $590,000 of new taxes the developer would get $590,000 of those taxes back times 10 years, you now hit that $6 million for that sewer line, and that was the credit enhancement agreement. After those 10 years, we will then be getting the full boat of the $1.18 million, and we don't have to pay anything back. That's a very simplified version of how it works, but that is the mechanism, that's the way that tax increment financing works from an overall scheme. 
Some places will do bonds for tax increment financing where the municipality, we take out a bond, which is risk, and then we build the sewer line hoping that the development is happening. We're not proposing to do that. We're proposing to utilize these credit enhancement agreements as our, our preferred methodology for tax increment financing. So that's the, the general financing of tax increment financing. As far as our program and what we're doing, we're looking at it in, in really three steps. So right now, that public hearing that's gonna be in a couple of weeks is on the tax increment financing policy. That policy sets the framework for how all of our future tax increment financing districts will be set up. It lays the groundwork for what we will and won't do, the types of funding and mechanisms, the ratios of what we will be willing to give back to a developer or not, all consistent with state law. If that policy is passed by the town council, then we will be looking to develop specific master plans in the town, Route 1 and 184, and within those master plans we'll define districts, similar on the uh, last slide presentation I showed a couple of districts, just very general boundaries. These are the properties that are in the district, and then there are others that are not. We can always expand the district at a later time if we so choose to. It'll then also lay down what are the types of things we want to finance? Are there streetscape improvements? Are there water line improvements? Uh, putting utilities underground, bike paths, sidewalks, green spaces, other infrastructure, better stormwater basin improvements, facade, you name it, we can put it into there. And that is all financed through the TIF. So that's the master plan. Each one of those, the town council looks at, they refer to the planning commission, there's a public hearing, and then they would adopt those each individually. Once the policy is in place, once the master plan is in place, that's when a developer would come in and say, hey, I want to do this $80 million development. And then we would go through that other process on that credit enhancement agreement, which you also get a bite of that apple too. So that's the financing and some of the processing that we're doing when it comes for tax increment financing. So I might have actually just uh, kind of jumped ahead a little bit in uh, my explanation, but who decides where to create the TIF? The developer can ask, but it's the town council that ultimately decides where those master plan districts are. And what happens if the project doesn't happen? Well, again, if we use that credit enhancement agreement, if they don't ever pay us taxes, we're not ever paying them anything back. So that's TIF in an eight minute nutshell. Um, we'll give a, a little bit more in depth uh, presentation and uh, talk about it at that public hearing. I believe in everybody's packet there's also the tax increment financing policy. I'm happy to answer any questions either tonight or in the next couple of weeks if people are reading through it um, and, and confused or think it's a little dense. We are here to help you and guide you through some of these initiatives that, that we're talking about. So. So with that said, tax increment financing, any questions? Thank you, that was helpful. Okay. Uh, Representative Whitehouse. So I, I think you answered this, but I wanna make sure I understand um, completely. Uh, so there is no possible way that the town can be left holding the bag if there's an earthquake and the development falls down or the developer goes out of business or they build a giant pile of rocks instead of a mixed use development. Um, is there any scenario in which we can end up having to pay for something we don't get? If we bonded, that's a possibility. If, there, if we enter into a credit enhancement agreement, which is the way that we're recommending, that's the preferred methodology that's outlined in our policy and will be in our master plans, if they don't pay us the taxes, there's nothing we will be legally required to have to pay them back. Thank you. Yeah. Representative Katowski. I'd like to stick with the sewer line. Currently, it's my understanding that when a sewer line goes in, people are assessed and then they pay a connection fee. If the developer is picking up the whole cost, will the properties along the way from the Marriott to Route 184 still have that same process of being assessed and pay a connection fee? They may have to pay, if they want to connect to the sewer line, Again, those are some of the details that we haven't got into yet because we haven't designed the sewer line. And those are all questions that through a public process will get answered. Those people won't necessarily get assessed for 
the <coughs> cost of putting the sewer line in, but if they want to tie into it, there may be a cost. I mean, if they're going to utilize it, just as if one developer is carrying the whole cost of that $6 million in the estimate, it could be four, it could be somewhere in that general t uh, dollar amount to bring it up to 184 and 117, and other property owners at that intersection want to tie in, that'll have to be factored into it also. Again, we're not looking to just put a, a sewer assessment on people that don't want to pay it, that don't want it, but if people want to tie into it, somebody has to get paid back for that new infrastructure component that they're able to utilize that increases their development capacity and their property values. Representative Monaghan. Thank you, Director Reiner. Um, Am I correct that, for example, you said uh, 184, 117, you had that big circle there. Am I correct that that does not affect any property in that circle except someone who develops new, right? Correct. So there, there's no harm to you being within that. It's no. just a matter of trying to draw people in to develop, although I assume that if you had a piece of property that you wanted to modify, you could probably take advantage of, of that. You could, uh, so some of the other more specific, yes, everything you said is correct. Some of the more specific parameters, you can only participate in TIF if you're doing a million dollars or more of improvements, not including acquisition of the land cost. But So we're not just going to do it for, hey, I'm putting a new back door on my commercial building. I want a tax and current financing for that. No. We're setting some thresholds. But good question. Again, not a new tax. If you're in the district and you don't want to do anything, you don't have to do anything. We don't force you. But it's a great opportunity for if you wanted to redevelop your property, take it to the next level, this is a way that we can help. Representative Chase. Thank you. Just so I understand the money part of it, the, the entire amount of tax on your example is 1.1 million. Eventually, that's yes. what the town will get for the property. Yes. So when you say the town share of 590000 we're just not receiving that. We're not paying that out, correct? No, actually, what we would end up doing is, we, in this hypothetical example, we would get a check from the developer for $1.18 million okay. for the full tax amount, the okay. full build out. We would then write that developer a check back for five, if Nine, we negotiated at a 50% split right. for 10 years, 590000 each year for 10 years after they paid us their taxes already. Oh, okay. So it's not, oh, you only pay us half. It's you have to submit, then we pay it back. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, accounting that goes into this. There's a lot of oversight. We'll be working with finance every year to be reporting on this to make sure that we're keeping track of where the money's going, that we're paying things in the right way. Um, again, we are accountable to all of you, to the council, to the taxpayers of the town. Are there stipulations to, um, so once they give you the 1.18, are there stipulations of whether you give them that other half or not? Back? That's all negotiated as part of that credit enhancement agreement. Okay. All right. Thank you. Representative Streeter. Thank you. Uh, John, this is, to me, synonymous or it appears to be the same as a, as a tax abatement for five years or ten years. Mm -hmm. Are there going to be escalators as it's reassessed, number one? Mm -hmm. Number two, we, we agree with this program to put in this $6 million sewer line, mm -hmm. and they go belly up in two years. What happens then? They built the sewer line. They financed the sewer line. It's not on us to pay for it. Now, that's their asset. Again, these are all things that we'll negotiate with them, with their attorneys. Is it possible that um, other people in that district say, all right, well, we want to pay for it. We want to do a development. These are all things that we will work out as part of the contingencies. But because 
I don't even have an application yet for that $80 million development. It's a little hard to dive into mm. the real specifics. Once we get into that credit enhancement agreement and we're bringing it to the RTM, these are great questions then when I have more specifics. Um, this is very different than a tax abatement. A tax abatement, we end up doing almost as a after the fact, hey, you need this to kind of finance the project, but there's no guarantee of new public infrastructure that doesn't just benefit this one developer, it benefits everyone. I mean, when we do a, a tax abatement for any of the number of places that we have before, yeah, we get the benefit of having that business come here, but we're not getting better sidewalks or streetscapes. It's not reinvesting back into the community. And it's usually for a, a very short period of time, anywhere from two years to seven years. This could go on, state law allows up to 50 years. In our policy, we put the maximum is 30 years. I don't know, depending on the scale of the project and the infrastructure and improvements needed, who knows how long it'll have to drag out. But again, that's negotiated as part of that credit enhancement agreement. And there are escalators as far as when we reassess the property. There could be escalators. Again, those are all things that we can negotiate as part of that credit enhancement agreement of, all right, well, we're going to say the taxes are stable for five years at this. And this is because developers need certainty. They need to understand mm -hmm. what the finances are and not have uh, crazy costs that they never factored in before. Um, there was one other question that you had as part of that. That's it. That's all I had. Oh, okay. All right, there's something else I was thinking of in there. Thanks, so. John. Yes. Representative Bordelon. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, thank you, uh, actually, for coming out and presenting this. I think this is long overdue, needed, forgotten. Uh, I'm pretty excited about the, you know, where this will take us. With that being said, I do have concerns about, you know, down the road when this document is um, written up about how all that will look in reference to, um, you know, who's deciding who we're financing under this TIF, looking at making sure companies, you know, can sustain themselves. But the way that I'm reading this without digging too deep, it looks like it's a short-term small investment for a very long-term gain over time, which is really exciting for us. So yes. I'm really excited about that. My other concern would be also in that document, making sure that we're preserving um, some of the natural habitats around here as well as, um, you know, the environmental impact, making sure those documents are heavily protected as far as, you know, we're looking at the particular areas and, you know, we're covering all of our bases there so we don't have any major problems down the road. Yeah, no, uh, all, thank you. Th thank you, all, all very good concerns. Um, our larger plan of conservation and development talks about protecting our natural habitat, our resources, uh, our water resource protection district, our groundwater, I mean our surface water that we utilize for our drinking water. Those are things that we're protecting through some of our zoning and some of our other long range plans. The areas that we're proposing for these TIF districts, in fact, are the areas where we've targeted for redevelopment. I mean, if, if you look at the Route 1 corridor, a lot of that was built before they had real true stormwater management or things that would handle and clean rainwater as it goes into developments before it goes into that basin or that wetland or stream and then right out to Long Island Sound. As we get new development that replaces the old, we're going to get much better environmental protections in the areas that are already developed. Um, in, in addition, just to kind of toot the horn of some of the staff uh, in the department. So uh, Deb Jones has a master's uh, in environmental uh, studies. Paige Bronk, our economic and community development manager, has a planning degree with a, a focus on environmental planning. My master's in planning, environmental planning focus, my master's in coastal management. We're all very environmentally minded. We're all very concerned about protection of the environment and natural resources in Groton. And balancing that with the needs of people and the development that we need in our everyday lives. So hear you loud and clear. We're here to protect the environment, but also get good development that's of quality that we all want to see happen here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Please, any questions, let us know. Uh, within that booklet, there's a fact sheet about TIF, maybe a page on both sides, a lot of information. Uh, Next Wednesday night, please come to the Zoning Commission hearing, 27th uh, 
happy to see you and hear from you at the public hearing on tax increment financing. Thanks again. The next thing on our agenda is the report of the superintendent of schools. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Green. My grandfather from Barcelona would insist on Grenier. Grenier, got it. I I, uh, I gave out a uh, 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 a little handout ab about our Alliance District application and some remedial interventions. Uh, if, if anyone hasn't gotten that, uh, there's, a, there's a pile on the, on, on the table over there. Uh, but let me, let me start just, just quickly, you may have seen it in the paper. Uh, last night we, we kind of launched our new magnet middle schools. Uh, we, we met with the parents last night uh, because a Cutler Middle School next year will operate as a, uh, uh, an arts and humanities uh, school. And Westside will operate as a science, technology, engineering, and math, a STEM school. And so we, we, at, we met with the parents and they uh, will select, uh, they will have the opportunity to choose if they want to stay in their, in their neighborhood school. Uh, people on the, on the east side of town will, will go to color. If they choose, that preference will be honored. And people on the west side of town will, will go to, to west side. And those who want to switch uh, and go to the theme magnet uh, will have an opportunity to uh, put their uh, their uh, their choice in, and we'll hold a lottery. And uh, students uh, next year will, will begin uh, that. Uh, and then after two years, of course, those those two schools uh, will become part of the consolidated middle school. And so the STEM pathway at the new middle school and the arts and humanities pathway will, will, will continue. Uh, but I, actually, uh, I got a note from the moderator, and so I wanted to provide this information. Um, the, first, uh, the first sheet uh, is the uh, Alliance District. It's the draft of the application that, that we put in. It is being considered by the State Department of Education right now. Uh, there are four categories, uh, uh, talent uh, priorities, uh, academics, culture and climate, uh, and operations. And as I think I said last time, we, we received from the State Department of Education a $600,000 grant, uh, which will, uh, that funding will expire on June 30th, and we're not assured of any uh, f funding going forward, but uh, they did uh, give us uh, this amount of money, and so you can you can see, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, but we basically put uh, put put money in uh, personnel and curriculum writing and uh, social worker. We're we're trying to deal with our attendance issues, uh, and then some operations, uh, computer uh, technology, and 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 so forth. Uh, the second the second document. Uh, has to do with uh, remedial interventions. And uh, basically, uh, just to run this down, the, at the elementary schools, uh, the remedial services are by and large uh, provided. Each, each school has a literacy specialist, which is to say uh, provides intervention for individual uh, children. Uh, and some have more than other schools. It is based upon the enrollment. Uh, so there's a specialist that essentially coaches the teachers, uh, interventionist that provides direct support to, to the children. Uh, and each of the Title I uh, schools, uh, each of the Title I elementary schools have, uh, have tutors, have, have, have reading tutors. Uh, same is basically true in math. Each elementary school has a, a math specialist, which is a coach, which provides uh, some uh, interventions. Most of the day, actually, is, is uh, provide, uh, uh, provides uh, interventions for the children, and, and all schools have math tutors. And we, we also have uh, English language learner children, uh, and so each of, uh, there is one English language learner for all the elementary schools, 
uh, and uh, part-time tutors at, at each of the schools. At the middle school, a uh, li little bit different because Westside is, is a Title I school, uh, Cutler has a, a literacy specialist, uh, a math specialist, a, a part-time English language learner, children who come from other countries, uh, a math tutor. And in the case of the middle schools, uh, what we call tier two intervention uh, is actually provided as, as, as part of the program. So both language arts and math teachers uh, teach a tier two, uh, in, 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 in Connecticut, remediation is actually called uh, SRBI, scientifically based uh, research intervention. And so those interventions are actually provided in the classroom uh, above and beyond the academics. And so the, uh, the core academics. And then at Westside, the same thing, literacy specialist, math specialist, part-time ELL. But because they're a Title I school, there are two ELA tutors, English language arts tutors, two math tutors. Uh, again, the, the uh, language arts and math teachers uh, teach a, a block e every day. Uh, but in the case, uh, because of Title I, uh, there is a morning uh, math support and enrichment class uh, provided uh, at Westside uh, in math and in, uh, in, in reading and writing. And then at the high school uh, e ELL, we, we have uh, several, several teachers, uh, I mean, two students uh, who don't speak English as their native tongue. Uh, so we have a part-time teacher there. We actually have a course, uh, Spanish for native speakers, uh, as, as well as uh, English language learner classes and, and tutors. We have math intervention classes. Those are actually classes uh, set aside for students who struggle with math and reading and writing, uh, tutors. And then we, we have a Falcon Academy, which is actually supervised by teachers, but it's a it's a student-to-student -student, uh, tutoring program that is provided uh, after school. And then uh, next year, uh, all of those programs are fully funded in, in the budget uh, that the board will present. Uh, but in the case of the high school, they're actually uh, going to provide academic su support and success classes uh, taught by certified teachers. Uh, so that's my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Representative Newsom? Yes, sir. Did you say Spanish for native speakers? Right. We, we have a course uh, in advanced Spanish for people uh, for whom that is their native tongue. Why, why are we teaching kids who speak Spanish to speak Spanish better? Or should we be... Well, it's actually a literature course. And we, we teach Americans English as well for four years. And so we provide them with literature courses. That makes no sense to me. But... I will, I will defer. I would think that the money would be better off teaching them English as opposed to Oh, no, they're fluent. Improving they're, they're, their no, those, stu those students experience. are fluent in English. I, I, I misspoke. They're fluent in English. They're bilingual. And so we provide them a, a rich literacy experience uh, in that. Representative Bordelon. Um, thank you, Madam Moderator. Good evening, Dr. Gineer. Um, I had a couple questions looking at the second page. Um, Westside and Cutler, the one liter literacy specialist um, and the math specialist, um, what are their, uh, are they full day, half day? Full day. So all four of those specialists are currently at Westside and Cutler full days. Great. So the literacy specialist is no longer half at Westside and half at Cutler? Correct. That's good to hear. Um, also, I have concerns about the English as a second language part-time at the high school. Is that enough um, when you have the, the same amount of support in the middle schools um, for a high school of the, the population? I mean, are we, we able to we service? Have, yeah, we, we actually have a, 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 a Spanish teacher who provides some of that support and we have uh, an English language learner teacher. Um, mm -hmm. We have... Uh, we have two English language uh, teachers uh, who service the district and with, with several tutors. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and the, the children are, are assessed each spring, and mm -hmm. that seems to be making good progress. So, so you think I, the part-time ELA teacher is enough at the high school level currently? 
ELL. ELL, I'm sorry, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, my next question is um, the lack of support for 504 students at the high school. Is there any incentive this year to provide uh, proper services like our surrounding districts to uh, make sure the 504 students are being ac academically supported um, for their 504? Thank you. Can you explain what 504 well, yeah, is? Yeah, I can are, explain. Five, f 504 is, uh, is a program when uh, students uh, are, are unable to access their curriculum. Sometimes it's for physical disabilities. But the most common is uh, uh, students with mobility problems. Uh, they are given access to elevators and, and that sort of thing. Um, we do provide, and those are uh, those are federally mandated. So e each each child has its own 504 plan, and uh, that 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 is uh, that is uh, explained in, in federal statute. Mike, my, my, that's my question. I apologize. Um, the, the 504 that I speak of, that is the majority of the population at Fitch High School, um, from my understanding, are children who do not fall under an IEP, so therefore they don't need that much intervention. But they're 504 because they might be identified as having ADD or ADHD, which they don't utilize elevators. They need academic support, and we're lacking it at our high school. I know that, for example, I can speak for Old Lyme, and I have submitted a form to your assistant superintendent as well as um, the special ed coordinator and the school um, of examples in our surrounding areas as to how they are supporting to meet the standards and achievements um, by offering a, a study hall during their CTL rotations instead. Students are, are being identified and going in there to get extra help on work and things like that. The majority of the 504 kids that I speak of, once again, have ADD and ADHD, have a learning style, and um, therefore sometimes fall behind the curve. So that's what I was looking to see. Uh, I'll, I'll work with uh, Ms. Austin. Thank you. We'll look into that. Representative Katowski. Oh, I'm sorry. White, uh, Representative Whitehouse was, had his hand back. Um, I have a simple question. What's a uh, Title I school? Okay. <laughs> Title I is uh, t Title I of the Federal Education uh, Act. And for, uh, for schools who have a high percentage of free and reduced lunch children, uh, there is a grant that is awarded. Uh, so it, it, in essence, it's, 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 a, it's a remedial grant where the, the, the money is earmarked uh, to provide those sorts of services to, to children that uh, would, would need additional support. Representative Katowski. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I have two questions. The first one is regarding the new magnet schools. I believe last month you mentioned that you got a four million dollar grant to establish these ma magnet schools. Well, four million over five years, yes. Okay, and that's off budget. That's off budget. Okay. So the magnet magnet school expenses until we get to the new mega middle school you're not going to put any magnet school expenses in the budget. They're going to all be through this grant? That's right. OK. All right. And my second thing is um, about Pleasant Valley. And if you don't have the answer with you tonight, I can wait till next month. Mm -hmm. um, I seem to remember that we were saving $1.8 million when we closed Pleasant Valley. When we get the budget, will we be able to see in the budget exactly where that savings is? Uh, yes, I, I did it uh, about 30 seconds before this meeting. I realized I should have brought the chart that I gave to the town council last night. But let me just do a little bit of mental math. Uh, the the budget was cut uh, last spring by 2.8 million dollars. Uh, so the the board dropped the budget by 2.8 million dollars. Uh, when, when I came here in, in January, thank God, uh, the, you voted to put the 1.5 back. Uh, so that, that brought us back to zero. And, and th therefore, there's uh, $1.3 million uh, that, that was, uh, well, thanks so much. Uh, there, there, there was uh, $1.3 million. It's, it's $1,277,000, uh, thanks to Councilor Franco, 
Th that's, that's what we saved by, by illuminating 18 teaching positions, principal, secretary, and, and so forth. So the, the, I, think the, I think the challenge of trying to understand what happened, but I, I'll make sure this is in the budget presentation, is that we, we lost, the, the board lost $2.8 million. So by restoring 1.5 million, that only left 1.3 uh, that was reduced, and, and that reduction came from Pleasant Valley. You can have a follow-up question. So if we got back to zero, does that mean we just really reduced the proposed increase and we didn't really save any money? Yeah, the pro the proposed increase was one point uh, was about one point three million dollars. So by going back to zero, we wiped out the proposed increase. Yeah, that's w another way of looking at it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, you have another question? Okay, yes, Representative. Wilson. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Dr. Grenier, when you were talking about the six hundred thousand dollars for being in the Alliance District, I think you mentioned that you were going to fund. Uh, personnel, some personnel out of that money. Yep. But then you said that there's no guarantee that that money's going to be around right. in follow on years. So, does this mean that we would end up having to pick up the cost of those personnel, or would we have to lay those people off if we lost that grant? The, 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 the personnel are in, we made sure there's actually not too much personnel in there. Uh, but the personnel that are identified in the Alliance District have been put into next year's budget. So we won't lay them off. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> I think the next thing on our agenda are uh, liaison reports, and I'm not sure there are any, so I'm just going to go through them really quick. And if and there may be some, so if you have one, when I call you, please stand up and give your report. Uh, so, so we have, uh, let's see, there's uh, the town council. Do you want to give a report? I have a report on the town council February 6, 2018 meeting. Um, there was a public hearing on 2018 uh, Excuse me? Oh, do you want to come up to this microphone? It might be louder. Thanks. Okay, Town Council meeting, February 6, 2018. At first, there was a public hearing on 00112, an ordinance amending various ordinances to increase fees. There were no public comments. The council briefly discussed the list of streets included to prohibit livery vehicles as well as violation, ticketing, etc. This will eventually be coming to the RTM. More, TM, more information is available on the website. So to get more information, you just need to go to the calendar and click on February 6th and everything will be there. At the regular meeting, the town council approved a resolution authorizing the release of highway funds to the city of Groton. This conversation included that there is a committee with representatives from both the town and the city to review town and city highway expenses. Also, a joint town and city council meeting is scheduled and that these meetings will be quarterly. The town council approved a resolution to close out the Virginese court project. The town council approved a resolution authorizing the senior center to apply for a grant from Liberty Bank for $3,500. The Town Council approved a resolution accepting the FYE 2017 audit report. The Town Council approved a resolution setting a public hearing on a tax increment financing policy for Tuesday, February 27th at 6 p.m. at the Town Hall Annex. The Town Council approved a resolution to endorse the Connecticut Port Authority Assistance Agreement and issue a letter of offer of grant funds to submarine base New London for the construction of a floating dock. The Town Council approved the Board of Education Schools Custodian and Maintenance Association Collective Bargaining Agreement. The Town Council approved a resolution authorizing 
formal agreement with the University of Connecticut regarding undersea supply chain consortium grant. This was discussed at the January 23rd meeting in detail. So if you want to get more information on it, you can just go to the calendar and click on January 23rd. There were two resolutions regarding the merit property land swap. One to suspend the rules. The second to set a public hearing date on the land swap proposal because the first public hearing on November 1st, 2016 was not properly noticed. The public hearing is set for February 27th at 6 p.m. There will be a presentation regarding the property swap at the public hearing. Information again is available on the website, including Dick Boyer's letter that started the discussion. Last, the town council went into executive session to discuss employee performance goals. Submitted by me. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Board of Ed, Representative Bordelon, do you have a report? I do not, Madam Moderator. I just was waiting for you to announce it tonight, so. Okay. I do have a lot of information, but I'll, I look forward to sharing it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, I believe Representative Whitehouse, do you have a, no. And, uh, Representative Wells? Here I am. Yeah. No, we just chatted about this recently, so yeah, I don't think there's I'll any room. Take a look at that okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So now we have uh, committee reports. Uh, are there any uh, reports from finance? No report. Uh, community development and services? Report. Uh, education? Red, red, public safety? Sorry. Public work? No, no report. Public works? No meeting, no report. Sorry. And rules and procedures. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Katowski, did you have something you wanted to say? I just wanted to, um, you as sure? I spoke with um, the town clerk and yourself, I just wanted to bring to your attention the minutes from the Finance Committee meeting from January 10th that we received, I believe, on the 17th. Um, and. Uh, I was just wondering if and when they'll be approved by the RTM because we originally approved a report that's nothing like these minutes. Thank you. Well, we can approve the revised. Um, the, so there was a oral report because the uh, meeting occurred right before our last uh, RTM meeting and we did have a oral report that we approved and written minutes have been submitted and we could uh, have a discussion of that. I believe the chair of that committee is not prepared for that, so maybe we can defer that till next month. Okay. Does that sound okay? Yep. Thank you. So is there any uh, budget discussion? Representative Katowski? I just have two things I'd like to submit to the town, uh, town clerk to send out to the um, RTM. There was some um, information presented in the minutes on page uh, 12 that I just want to clarify. And basically, it's the documentation that, yes, in fact, there was an 8.7% tax increase last year and a, um, a really good explanation of why it doesn't do anybody any good if our home values go down. Thank you. If you can make that available, we'll have that sent out. All right. Is there any other discussion under that budget item? Uh, no. um, other business? Representative Katowski? I have three referrals to the Rules and Procedure Committee in writing. Yeah, I, we'd like it if you could read that those okay. through, please. The first one is, when the RTM is requested for the first time and act on an item at the same meeting, I propose that moving the question is not an option. The reason is that there is no time for members to research the issue and all comments and questions should be heard. My second one is, RTM committee meetings should not be held before RTM meetings. The reasoning is there is no time to do minutes. Perfect example of why is the committee uh, meet minutes should not be before RTM meetings is the January 10, 2008 Finance Committee meeting. And the third one is, I would like the Rules and Procedure Committee to consider moving the time of the RTM meetings up a half hour to begin at 7 o'clock, which I believe we do at budget time anyway. The reasoning is not all RTM members are retired and some of us must get up early the next morning. Okay, thank you. And we can refer those to Rules and uh, Procedures Committee if that's acceptable. 
Yes, yeah, you haven't been writing, so make sure the term clerk gets that copy, please. Is there any um, representative uh, Washington? I just have a question. Why does the full RTM um, approve committee minutes? Why doesn't the committee itself approve their own minutes? You know, I, I spoke with you prior to the meeting and the method that you laid out that the Board of Education does where the committee approves their own committee minutes seems to make sense to me. So I do not know the answer to that. I will defer to the town clerk. I can answer that. If you're, if you're comparing uh, committees from the Board of Ed and this body, they're nothing like each other. You have standing committees that meet regularly on the Board of Ed and that so you have the opportunity every month to review the meeting minutes from the previous meeting. RTM subcommittee meetings are all special meetings. You never know when you're going to meet. So you'd have to have a special meeting to approve your minutes in, in essence. So the body uh, owns all the minutes of every committee and themselves and so that's how, um, how it's designed because you, you don't meet regularly the subcommittees. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> Representative Mello Miller, did you have your hand up? No, no I was just mentioning that you, you didn't call on the Parks and Rec Committee, Oops. but we have no, no meeting, no minutes, so I didn't know if I should call to your attention or not. So Excuse me, my oversight. Uh, uh, Representative Streeter. Thank you. Uh, in consideration of Representative uh, her, her, her comment to exclude having a moving the motion on a new item, I would like to have the clerk as the parliamentarian for, the, for our body to look at that particular issue there because I don't think we can pick and choose where we want to uh, limit our move the question. I don't think we can I do that by that right opponent. The clerk will answer I, that right um, now. So the way your body is set up is you adopt your own rules. So you don't even have to have Robert's rules play into anything. You, but the way this body has uh, proceeded since 1957 is to adopt their own rules. And anywhere that their rules don't apply, they use Robert's rules. It could be another group of, of rules that you could use besides Robert's. Um, so to the, to the point of um, moving the question, I mean, that's something that the Rules Committee definitely will have to discuss and this body will have to adopt, but you, you could limit debate. You could not limit debate. It's your rules. Yeah. You see what I mean? So Robert's rules do not play into your rules. There's no tr overriding Robert's rules. You know, you don't, in other words, your rules, you have lots of them that don't work with Robert's. You have quite a few that don't work with Roberts, and that's quite all right because they belong to you. You decide what your rules are going to be. And, and our current rules, I believe, do have a 10-minute uh, kind of hold before a question uh, can be Could called, be. or the moderator will allow that to be called. Yeah. So that's what we have right now, of a 10-minute pause. They should vet it. They should vet it. They should talk about it. Anyway, so uh, thank you. If you would consider that, that would be terrific. Representative Monahan. We have a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Go have some dark chocolate.